mad if we're the same height sitting down, isn't it? That's why we don't have the same squat. Welcome back to Seekstan, and welcome back to a kind of commentary on something that came up recently. So, Joel Seedman or as some people call him, I think some people call him Joel Seaman, but we're not going to call him that, was on Mark Bell's Powercast, a very interesting guest, a lot of people clicked on it, I clicked on it, even you clicked on it, which mm. was interesting. So Joel Seaman has been the subject of a lot of shatters and accusations, people like Zach have done it, uh, someone else did it recently. Another. People comment on every live stream we have, Yeah, and we have a, like a broad rule of like, don't criticise other people's coaching, because yes. you don't know the person they're working with. Mm-hmm. But in this case, we're just going to talk about some of the things he talked about. There was one thing in particular that I want to talk about in regards to what he said on Mark Bell's podcast. So, uh, Mike Isertail made a guest appearance and ambushed Joel with some questions. There was one thing Fitz wants to talk about that kind of annoys him. My main concern with one of the things he was saying. So, we're not questioning Joel's methods. We're not commenting on the full range of motion thing. Uh, honestly... We don't think we need to. I think it's pretty clear. Yeah. Judging by the amount of comments on that video, judging by the comments on his Instagram before he deletes them, this isn't an argument. There is no... There is no... I don't even think we need to weigh in on this. I think it's completely pointless. But because it's quite a prolific uh, conversation, yeah. it's quite a prolific conversation in, in our kind of sphere, the fitness industry, where we do see it a lot. And like Fitz said, people do comment and ask us to talk about it a lot is one of the things he says, and we see this a lot, with especially with nutrition studies, uh, or nutrition parts of the kind of fitness industry, and we do see it with the, sometimes the strength conditioning, if someone's really pulled away from the mainstream. And one of the things, we'll play the clip over, or Alex will play the clip over, is he says... There's flip sides to every side of the science, as you know, you have, a, you know, whether it's, you know, the ketone diet, the paleo diet, whether anything we talk about in uh, the sports industry, there's always two sides of it. One side says this, the other side says this. So I think you can look at the research and there's probably research supporting uh, both sides, you know, what you're saying and maybe what I'm saying. But I think where what helped me kind of uh, apply what I have seen and believe in it more is just what I've seen uh, experientially at that point and anecdotally just from working with athletes. In short, basically, this condensed down is what he says, because a lot of people say this, is you can find studies to support both sides of the argument. And that, for me, is the most fucking annoying thing people ever say when they talk about stuff. You can find studies to support anything. Just like with the uh, virus that should not be named, and people talk about that. Loads of different things. People always say, well, I can just find studies to support both sides of the argument. First of all, I would like to say, please go find those studies. It's become almost a cliche or a trope at the moment where people talk about, oh, yeah, yeah, science doesn't mean anything, studies don't mean anything because I can find either ones. No, no, no. It's such a fucking lazy argument and it really bothers me when people say that. So you see us do pay-per-views. We did it for months and we're back at them. We do them nearly every week now again, going through pay-per-views and we spend like 32 hours going through one paper and then you see the condensed video. So you can see how much work goes through one video, you know, one paper, and we always talk through some of the parts that made the study really good, and we talk through some of the parts that made the study poor. Sometimes a paper will be very, very good. Sometimes the paper will be terrible. Very often you guys will weigh in in the comments and say why you don't think the paper was that useful, why some parts of the paper were not good. What that's emphasizing, what that's showing, is there's a huge amount of nuances per paper, okay, and per study, and you have to really understand the context with each one of these goes, okay? So... Just because Joel might be able to find a minority of papers which would favour the range of motion argument, this isn't even in particular about Joel exactly, because this is to any argument. Unless the context is put into those, unless you examine each one of those individually, all studies are not weighted the same. There's a reason journals have a weighted factor to their journal. So when their journal is kind of a um, produced to people or presented to people, Certain journals carry more credit, essentially. They have more street cred with their papers because they have more well-renowned authors. They have a better vetting process when those papers come in. So saying you have a paper to counteract another paper is like saying I found two random people on the street and I asked both of them the same question and both of those people gave me the opposite answer or two opposite answers. It means absolutely nothing. For example, if I got some well-renowned physicists come in and talk about the planet being round then i got a random person on the street who was a fat actor and he came in and talked about why he thinks the earth is flat who do we really want to give more weight to there who is it more likely is going to be correct who should we really be listening to if we're trying to do something 
with a flat earth or a round earth. Of course you're going to listen flat earth to the experts. And in that same manner, studies really are more nuanced than that. Now again, not even talking about Joel Seidman's case here, I'm not even saying that his studies are not correct. Uh, he doesn't link any studies, first of all. He presents them in an article where he references things. But I haven't gone through all those studies. I doubt he's gone through all those studies. So it's just really important to remember that that is a lazy argument from anyone. So if you're listening to someone and they say something like, oh, well, we can find studies to show either side, you should probably give that person a little bit less credit than you normally give them or you give them, okay? Because it's a very lazy, it's a very poor argument, okay? Because it's incredibly disingenuous because we know all studies are not the same. And so it's important to understand that we don't water down science or discredit the scientific methods, especially in the fitness industry where we are very early on in terms of our development of science. While the Soviets might have rushed through a lot of science in the 70s and 80s, realistically, even in the last 10 years, we're only in the very early days. We're essentially in the Isaac Newton days of apples falling from trees mm. in a lot regards to a lot of aspects. Okay, So it's very, very important that we don't get off on the wrong foot by talking about how the science doesn't really mean anything if we don't want it to mean anything. So it's just really important that we're being a little bit more careful how we're talking. And it's important that you are aware of that when you hear people talking about, oh, we can get studies to say anything. That's a very disingenuous and frankly, a lazy argument to go about things, okay? One, sorry, one thing as well. If you wanna read a study on the full range of motion, uh, Hartman et al in like 2013, they did a very comprehensive meta review in terms of just on the knee joint in relation to full depth squatting and partial squatting and obviously uh, partial squatting has agreed with a lot of other studies but more shear forces on the joint so it's a good read I'll, I'll link it below actually this comes down to the difference between a paper a scientifically reviewed peer-reviewed paper in a journal it comes down between a paper a good paper and a textbook that's been like recently updated so if you go into any university library you'll see hundreds or thousands of, of textbooks probably on very very similar areas when you open that front cover of that textbook you'll see 17th edition 19th edition third edition those editions are frequently updated due to the fact that more studies will come out so if it's in the area of biochemistry or biomechanics a study on squat depth will come out a team of reviewers will review that paper they'll then publish it or not publish it in the journal when people are writing textbooks and when people are doing revised editions of textbooks, they'll then see, okay, we've had 38 new papers in the area of squat biomechanics. We'll then review what we said about squat mechanics in the edition that was released three years ago. We'll look at our sources there. Are any of those sources referenced in these new papers? And then those new papers will form the revised edition of the new textbook. That doesn't happen with every paper that's on uh, Google Scholar doesn't happen that every paper that's on sports discus pubmed whatever it is a lot of papers go out and they sit in that ether of like the scientific knowledge base and they just sit there nothing is ever really done with them if you look at them on google scholar they might have they might have been cited 10 times or 50 times or whatever the big weighty heavy important papers you'll see very high levels of citation you, I think it's 90% of papers get referenced one time or less or yeah. less than once, something yeah. like that. So it's like, there's a huge difference. It's like the difference seeing someone who's fully qualified as a doctor talking about an injury you have in your hand and then Owen talking about his hand because he also owns a hand. You know, like there's, you cannot compare papers just by the fact that they're both published. Um, publishing, can, we could have something published here in a number of months. It means nothing, you know, and we know nothing anyway. Uh, but that is, uh, to kind of piggyback on Garth's point, that's a real thing you really do need to think about is like, finding papers is so easy. Like, I'll find a paper in the next 10 minutes that can show basically anything I want, but you can't give all papers the same level of credit. My piece, and the piece that really annoys me, is nothing to do with this. Uh, my piece is a piece where you ask someone a specific question, what are you doing? this exercise with this athlete and then this person immediately goes to well when i was throwing or when that athlete was throwing professionally uh professional baseball or when this professional nfl athlete was doing this and they talk about the hyper specific case yet they apply it broadly across all people 
all people don't have a shoulder range that's incredibly impeded by a shoulder injury or by multiple surgeries to one shoulder. All people don't have very high levels of strength or stability or range of motion within a shoulder that has to be kind of catered to. When you have a broad audience of people listening to you, you need to know the way very broadly. You know, you need to know how to then apply it specifically. And then when you disseminate information, you once again need to go with the broad approach. It's like us saying, oh, well, two weightlifters we have at the moment, they're squatting more than seven times a week. And then putting up constant posts about that weightlifter squatting more than seven times a week. We never do that. We have athletes who train like that. Gurf is an athlete who trains like that. But that isn't what you tell people when you're putting up your really flashy Instagram pictures or putting up your TikToks about this is how you get better. This is how we should train. That's what really annoys me. And then when you use your backup case as, oh, this really good professional athlete is doing it. This really exceptional person is doing it. And I coach them. So I know that has nothing to do with anything. Most of the time, particularly in strength and conditioning, if you have incredibly talented athletes, you're doing way less with them. You have about as much influence on that athlete as what brand of milk or bread they buy in the morning. They are incredibly unique and incredibly talented due to factors that are outside of your control. And particularly if you come into this athlete later in their career, most of what you're doing is damage control. You look at what you'd like them to do, you'd say, this is risky, this is risky, I don't have enough time for that. And then you end up with a session that's probably around 30 to 40 minutes long and you're doing push-ups and air squats to a box. The talented athlete thing gets people's attention, right? It gets your name on a Eurosport article. There's people with a bag of money looking at you in the gym like this. like Yeah, 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 yeah. Athlete. Yeah, like you're, the, the talented athlete thing loses so much credit when you start to look and say, okay, you actually don't do anything with them because you don't need to do anything with them. If myself and Gurf started programming for Clarence Kennedy in the morning mm -hmm. and started going on about like, oh, well, we've not do this snatches 190 whatever kilos, that, <laughs> that has nothing to do with myself and Owen. You really do need to look at like frameworks as a whole, how you approach everyone. Everyone falls within those kind of two standard deviations from the mean. And that's what makes people good whether at, whether it's at uh, disseminating scientific stuff, whether it's at coaching athletes, whether it's programming for athletes, it's knowing how to understand a broad population is important. And it's just unfortunate that people get really starstruck by, oh, I'm coaching this guy right now. And they say, oh shit, that guy's really good at playing whatever sport he plays. Maybe I should do that because I want to be really good too. Uh, in fact, you want to go to the most standardized approach because you're not special and you probably never will be. Okay, thanks for watching. So again, not even weighing in on the argument because I don't even think it's, it's worth our while. I wouldn't even entertain. <laughs> Just look at the last 100 something videos we made would probably be a better argument for that, okay? So thanks for watching. Let us know your thoughts in the comments or whatever. Let us know what you thought of, of the, the thing for having Mark on. Interesting that Mark Bell had him on, had Joel on. It was quite a surprise because I know Zach had reached out to Joel Seedman a few times for an argument, and I'd still I'd love to see the Sudos arguing. I'd love yeah, to see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike, I like Mike's style of arguing, which would be probably closer to what we would we would be doing, which is just a little bit calmer and a little bit more uh, questioning. And then if you understand the question, then you imply what Mark was saying to him, for example, or Mike is retail, sorry, not Mark. Uh, you understand that you know it's it does a lot said between the lines, whereas Zach yeah. would be a little bit more obtuse. And a whole lot more entertaining. Yeah. If you do want to see some of the pay-per-views we're talking about, we'll have a playlist linked below uh, in the description or in the comments. You can have a look. There's lots of pay-per-views up there. Yeah, actually, maybe go to Mark Bell's podcast. And uh, I think Zach has a comment on, I think, the one on Mike Isertel. So maybe reply to that one and just add some comments to the thread so Mark knows that he should have Zach on. And maybe Zach, be great. And Zach and Joel on. That would be great yeah. for us. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks.